Lastly, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Eckhard Grohl, uh, the William uh, and Florence Perry head of the School of Mechanical Engineering and also Riley Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Eckhart, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Arvind. I uh, appreciate it. It's uh, my pleasure now uh, to uh, introduce uh, Martial Gonzalez, uh, who is a, a recent uh, associate professor here in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue. Uh, Martial joined us uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, he received his PhD and MS degrees uh, from Caltech. And then prior uh, to being at Caltech, uh, he received a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Buenos Aires in 2002. Uh, Marcel is really a dedicated scholar and educator as you, as you will see, as you will hopefully uh, present in his remarks. His research sits at the interface of virtual physical particulate engineering, and it focuses on developing predictive modeling simulation and characterization techniques at and across different scales uh, to further the understanding of microstructure formation and the evolution in confined particular systems. Uh, his research has an emphasis in manufacturing processes and uh, the relationship between product fabrication and performance. Uh, application areas of interest uh, include uh, particular products and processes continuous manufacturing, performance uh, of pharmaceutical solid products, biomaterials, and energetic materials. Uh, his research has been sponsored by a broad range of government agency, including AFOSR, NSF, FDA, uh, DOED, AFRL, ONR, and DOE, as I mentioned, broad uh, spectrum of government agency, but also industry, like including uh, Bridgestone Americas, Natalie Engineering, Whirlpool, and Procter & Gamble. Uh, and within Purdue is very active in the Center for P uh, Particular Products, uh, as well as the Purdue Energetics Research Center. Uh, but on top of all of this research, he is really uh, has an exceptional teaching record. Uh, he has made a great personal uh, contribution and strong efforts to advancing the ME curriculum. In particular, he has developed our new instructional laboratory for our mechanics of materials course. Uh, and on top of all of this has been uh, very active uh, in engaging our undergraduate students in research, right? We are independent research projects and SERV programs. So I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing uh, Martial's comments today and I will send it and uh, please help me welcoming him for, for his remarks today. So Martial, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Eckhart, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. And I have to say that when, when I was asked to reflect on my journey, I remembered immediately the summer of uh, 2015, when at the time, uh, Anil Bejash, the head of the department, the person who hired me, asked me to present as part of the Global Engineering Professional Seminar. And this was right six years ago. Actually, the logo was different, right? For the university logo. And, and this is how I framed that, that seminar as well, a journey of teaching, research, industry, and learning. So I'm using that as a platform for now presenting to you my journey that touches upon teaching experiences, research in connection with the industry and a recursive, I would say, need of learning and learning uh, new things. And, and this, the journey started uh, right after high school when I was uh, back in Argentina and I actually became a high school teacher. So I graduated from high school and I was a high school teacher during the day and a college student during the night. And this was a really, really unique uh, place. Uh, this high school was a technical high school, um, uh, the high school where I also uh, graduated and became a, a teacher. Uh, a high school truly, truly committed to training the technicians of, of tomorrow. And at the time, we were doing really cutting edge uh, projects, uh, infusing our students with uh, entrepreneurial uh, ideas, uh, something that translated at the time, for example, in projects like this one, so depending on your age, maybe Attila's a, a, a NASA and MIT robot uh, sounds uh, familiar to you, right? But we were building similar things at the time um, with the high school students. But uh, the time in 1995, 1996 was also the times where internet arri arrived to Argentina and 
this was uh, I was responsible uh, with a number of uh, high school students to really connect uh, the, the the entire high school to internet. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure this was the first high school in Argentina that had every single uh, computer connected to internet, but also engaged with this. Uh, uh, exceptional high school students in, in projects that uh, today they are all seen as inter, in, in the first internet entrepreneurial projects. Right, that these students, many of them went to college, but many stayed as uh, 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 the first entrepreneurial people in Argentina, truly dedicated to internet and IT. And uh, when when we established this connection, not even the the search engines that we have today were available. I remember having to open a, like a phone book to find the address of uh, MIT and Caltech, the two places that, that I connected uh, first when I established that connection. Very, very happening times and a really a good experience for me to realize that uh, it's really, really rewarding to work with exceptional people. And that's something that I uh, work hard to recreate during my career uh, to work with exceptional colleagues to work with uh, exceptional mentees, to work with exceptional students. So when I was about to graduate from, from a college and I pursue the University of Buenos Aires, as Eckhart mentioned, a degree in mechanical engineering, I transitioned to the industry and uh, worked there, finished my degree working already as a research engineer in uh, iron making and steel making industry, uh, spent two years in this uh, place uh, completing my undergrad thesis uh, working full time uh, in really at the time doing computational solid mechanics of manufacturing processes, the type of things that I do these days as well. And in particular also continuous manufacturing. So at the time where I was modeling continuous, uh, continuous casting processes, and just to give an idea, I think you can realize the temperature of these parts, but to give you an idea of the size, right there you have a person. So to me it was fascinating to to be part of this, to do research, to do computational modeling, uh, to do as, uh, really assist manufacturing and have a direct impact. I work not only on continuous manufacturing, but also uh, on, on, on uh, I model blast furnace processes. Again, just to give an idea of the size of this, this is a person and this opening is this opening right here. So very, very impressive things that um, really kept me motivated and, and, and doing high level work for, for a good number of years. But then I realized at some point that uh, that was the only place in Argentina. And even though it offered me the opportunity to travel the world and deploy these, these models to factories, say in Venezuela and Italy, right? This was the only place in Argentina where I could do that. So in order to sort of expand my possibilities and always stay committed to the, to the idea of being able to choose what to do and where to do it, I decided to come here to the States. And I did that in the context of pursuing graduate studies and I went to, to Caltech. Uh, again, a, a beautiful and exceptional place where I further my um, sort of a training in computational solid mechanics. I also did a minor in material science and I truly, truly got to understand what was the life of a faculty in, in, in a research university here in the US. Something that, that doesn't exist uh, in Argentina, I was working with uh, uh, academics that had a full-time uh, position in the industry and who was the director of the r and center I was working with, a person that was trained here in the US. But uh, this idea of having full-time professor doing research and teaching uh, is not necessarily the, the case in Argentina. So for me, that this was a, a great experience. Uh, 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 for example, I believe I took classes in these two lecture rooms. So, so I, I felt really sur surrounded and uh, by, by exceptional people and uh, committed to this idea of continue to do research throughout my career. But uh, the possibility of combining uh, teaching and research became clearly a, a good option. I still had in mind of maybe uh, going back to the industry. But once again, when I graduated in 2010, uh, I had a chance to choose among different opportunities. I decided to go to uh, Rutgers University, in New Jersey to pursue a postdoc and expose myself to once again, something new, something that forced me to um, learn a new concepts for material science, but also connected me back to, to the industry. And this was in, in the context of a large, very, very active, very successful ERC center uh, 
that involve Rutgers University, for University, and JIT, and University of Puerto Rico. I got to understand the relationship between academia and the industry here in the States, how that can be done at a high level. The center was funded uh, in recognition of a, a, a national need to retain pharmaceutical manufacturing in, in this country. Otherwise, uh, after some patents expiring, manufacturing will, it would have been transferred to other countries and uh, that would have be, been really an issue of national security and the NSF uh, and the federal go government recognized that uh, in the early 2000s and in, in I believe uh, 2008, the ERC was, was funded. A, a great experience for me, an opportunity, to, like I said, to, to uh, learn a totally different uh, industry. I, I was never exposed to the pharmaceutical industry. You may think how a mechanical engineering can contribute to that industry. Um, it was really a good op opportunity for me to contribute with a different background, computational modeling, solid materials, but also be exposed. At that point, I was well trained in solid materials, fluid materials or fluids and, and gases. And I was exposed for the first time to the fundamentals of granular materials. And that really marked my career from that point onwards. Uh, uh, understanding uh, granular materials is something that uh, still uh, poses a good number of uh, open questions and it's extremely relevant to the industry. So that allowed me to transition in 2014 to here in Indiana, Purdue. And at the time when I show this up to this point, these are things that I have shared again in, in 2015 with our undergrads here in the context of this seminar. And I told the students that if you take a look at this journey, right, probably you can see the Purdue P, right? I thought it was only fitting, right, to eventually uh, be here at Purdue, but the students did not find maybe this shape that truly resembling the P. So coincidence or not, three months later, I married my wife in Mexico. And I think now we are doing a better job at resembling this P. But uh, what, what really happened is that here at Purdue, when I joined here in 2014, all these pieces that I was referring to came together. And I realized my, my vision moving forward of really staying focused on granular systems. I, re I understood that uh, these granular materials are the second most manipulated material in the industry only after water. And I also recognize that even from a fundamental standpoint, since these materials are not well understood and so much used in the industry, um, the real, what, what happened at the end is that uh, most processes and uh, even the performance of these products are always uh, tailored and refined by trial and error. They always uh, uh, operate uh, below design conditions. And there was uh, a permanent need from the industry, all the industries and new industries to learn how to deal with these general materials uh, in a more effective and more predictable way. And in particular, I, I focus initially on granular systems at high levels of confinement, like those that they would happen during compaction processes. And this is a, a, a synthesis process, a manufacturing step used in many, many industries from the metallurgical industry to the plastic industry, to the ceramic industry, food energy, and of course the pharmaceutical industry. That was my first step into these uh, type of problems. But it also is it, related to a, a higher level, more um, broad question of how amorphous solids support stress. And this had impact uh, not only in the pharmaceutical industry, but also the entity that regulates the pharmaceutical industry, the FDA. But also, if you think about it, many other material systems of great relevance are comprised of particles or particle binder composites. And this was the case of energetic materials, for example. And that's why we have some um, complementary agencies here, not only the pharmaceutical industry, but also the defense industry uh, with uh, a direct uh, need of, of this type of understanding. So my work went from, like I said, uh, pro understanding processing and performance of pharmaceutical products, right? From a fundamental standpoint, but also um, the, uh, establishing manufacturing continuous round, uh, uh, routes um, for these uh, products. And here at Purdue, we have one of the two uh, continuous manufacturing lines in academia in the country. Uh, this, this has been a great experience to be part of a large team of people that contribute to the development of this. And of course, as the industry started to adopt this uh, continuous manufacturing ideas, the entity that regulates the industry had to uh, be on board and therefore 
we were funded over the last two years on large FDA projects that aim at developing the regulatory science needed to establishing and approving products made uh, using continuous uh, manufacturing. But I also, this, um, this type of uh, fundamental understanding opened me the opportunity to deal and contribute to the defense industry and the propulsion industry in the context of uh, energetic materials. And, and these energetic materials, the, the particulate system itself are energetic crystals, right? And they are surrounded by a, a binder that uh, provides uh, not only a connection between these crystals, but also protects them from uh, unexpected or unintended external insults. Uh, so so the, all the challenges posed by granular materials uh, became uh, uh, relevant to answering and, and contributing to, the, to this field. And then I also explore um, um, handling and, and transport of, of these uh, this, uh, granular materials in the context of powders and biomass. And this really, so, so uh, it was only possible, only possible through really colla collaborative and inter interdisciplinary efforts. That's, that was the main reason for me joining Purdue. I realized when, when I came here that that was in the spirit of, of this university. And I uh, was able to be part of that in the context of two programming teams that Ed had mentioned, right? The CP3 Center and the Perk Center here. I worked with exceptional students. That was all, also my initial realization surround me by exceptional people, grad students and undergrads. And also this created a, a platform for um, also um, sort of establishing a connection with uh, those that have a, a, um, a non-traditional career path. Uh, maybe I can label myself that way. as a person that had a non-traditional career path. So I, I created and, and, and took an opportunity to partner with uh, the Network of Computation and Nanotechnology uh, to bring here on campus uh, community college students during the summer, uh, have them work side by side with our best surf students and offer them a platform to um, transition well to a four year university. I would say out of these seven students, four of them now are applying to graduate school. Some of them are being accepted already. For, so for me, establishing this uh, um, career path for those that have chosen a, a non-traditional career path. These are students that definitely work and study uh, simultaneously, uh, work during the day and study during the night and establishing opportunities for them to transition to a for university and a grad school that became extremely rewarding to me, uh, an experience that I, I plan to continue after we go back to a more norm, normal operations here on campus. Um, and with that said, uh, thank you for your attention. And I know that this has been recorded and I have a number of people connected here. So let me also say that uh, to, to current and future undergrad students, uh, grad students, colleagues, you are invited to join my journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcial. Uh, wonderful remarks. I, I greatly appreciate it. I, uh, I love your, your international journey. Uh, and um, uh, because I had quite a few international uh, stops myself, uh, maybe I can kick off uh, the discussion here uh, by asking you, uh, how, do you how do these global experiences that, uh, that you had uh, influence your decision making, uh, maybe even like your, your career decision making, right, as you, as you move, uh, uh, move along and you're maybe, as you said yourself, non-traditional. Right. Yeah, I think uh, exposing you to different cultures, different people, different ways of thinking, it teaches you a lot. So, so I, I try to mention what I learned from these experiences. I got to understand what was the job of a, a professor here in the U.S. Uh, working in, in, in academia, right, and doing research. Uh, I understood what was uh, working in the industry back in Argentina, but uh, through the my ERC center, I also understood how uh, working with the industry here in the States uh, is and, and the differences between that. I think it's really a learning experience. That's why I have learning here as my last uh, uh, item in my journey, right? Learning and learning is not only on the technical side, but uh, learning about cultures and people. I think that's uh, part of the growth. And the, dec the decision making, I think, uh, the more one understands, the more options one creates for uh, themselves or himself or herself, uh, 
the better the choices one can make. And that has been my, my effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a comment in the chat box. Uh, Nathan Walsh uh, commented that he had you as a professor for ME 323, the uh, right strengths of material class, and uh, and enjoyed your enthusiasm, presentations, and kindness, uh, as well as your encouragement of students asking questions, even in the big lecture hall. Thank so, you, Nathan. Uh, yeah, happy to hear that. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, any questions uh, for Martial? Anybody else who would like to ask him a question? You can unmute or put something in the chat box. Hi, Marcel. This is um, Meng. And uh, sorry, I couldn't join the earlier part. Uh, I look forward to watching the video to get Stanley's part and the early part of your talk. Uh, congratulations. and. You know, I'm wondering what would you advise uh, Purdue Engineering College to uh, better, even better, support uh, those who follow a unique career trajectory, uh, whether that involves international stops or other uh, types of uh, career destinations before arriving here? Yeah, you know, I, I that's a good question. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind, right, when you, when you follow a non-traditional path, it, you spend time doing that, right? So, so I think the, the university needs to recognize that uh, the time of arrival at a given gate could be very different depending on the things that you did in the past, right? Uh, and that has uh, different consequences on, on a personal life, right, but also professional lives. And, and typically, I would say that, uh, in the same way that a very strike path uh, prepares excellent scholars and, and teachers, uh, a non-traditional path also does that, right? So, so I think acknowledging that uh, the time of arrival could be quite different and uh, accommodating for that, I think is important. And, and you know, may, maybe this is not a time to be too political, but a number of you know federal fellowships uh, impose some constraints on age, right? Um, and that's something that um, uh, I understand why it's there, right? There is a very clear purpose for that. But for those who follow a non-traditional path, uh, sometimes they are excluded, right? So I think I, understanding that, uh, I think it would be important. In terms of providing, um, I would say Purdue does a good job. I think that the opportunities provided to traditional and non-traditional paths are, are equivalent, uh, uh, well taken and, and yeah, well thought, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that encouragement. Uh, we here at Purdue Engineering welcomes and supports all types of trajectories for our talents. So uh, thanks again. Enjoy thank your you. talk very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Amy Reedman. Um, Amy. I had a question. I, I find your outreach to the community college students really impressive. And I was wondering if you had any insights how that could be expanded into um, other areas, how you might grow it beyond just yeah. what you're doing now. Um, yeah, I have explored that. So there, there are many, many pieces to this puzzle, right? That, that they need to be in place. So, so definitely you need, so let me share more details of this. So these students are coming from two different community colleges, but mostly from one, the Pasadena City College. And there is one student here who is coming from Ivy Tech. Um, so you, you, need, you need to cre create or have available a connection at of course, these uh, community colleges. Uh, and, and it has to be a, a mechanism for these students to already be exposed to, to some research before jumping into, a, say, an opportunity here at Purdue. So uh, the Network of Computational Nanotechnology has done a terrific job at establishing these connections. And of course, uh, they need us to keep these connections alive and active, right, and, and create this uh, flux of students. But uh, yeah, you need, you need to this, um, early stages of uh, research experiences, selecting from those the students that have potential and interest for transferring to a foreign university, uh, providing them a platform here or somewhere else in the country, right? Where they can recognize first that they can work side by side with what they are labeled as the best undergrads in the country doing research. Second, have an experience to, to even uh, spend time outside their own, their own state. Many of these students have never 
uh, went out of states for any any activity other than maybe vacations, right? So that's a, that's a, something that they recognize as well. They also they recognize that they can uh, uh, do research or study full time as opposed to balance work and research. That was that was also a thing to me when I went to grad school. I I felt that I was doing just one thing. Um, so so it, those are good experiences for 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 these students and and they they, they sort of you generate momentum for them. They will transfer right away. You have to find the right time into the for the university. Um, and then when they are there, they will be able to jump into the research again and sort of uh, get in the more traditional track and have motivation to go to guard school or continue in the, in the industry. That's up to them. But uh, that, that was a way to do it. You, you need contacts in these uh, uh, community colleges, definitely. Thanks. It's really, really impressive. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey, professor, thank you for that great presentation today. I was wondering, I really appreciate when my professors have industry experience and it's really nice to know, well, I have Professor Marcel right now for 323. Um, what do you think the most important takeaway you had from industry that we don't actually learn enough during our undergraduate years? Um, good question. Um, I think perhaps, yeah, let's put, let's put it this way, right? So when you're working in the industry, you have real, real problems, right? They are not idealized, right, in the context of a homework or a project where you have a well-defined boundaries, you know, that to what you learn uh, in the class it will apply directly to solving that problem, right? So when you're when you in the industry first, you need to be able to create that ideal scenario, right, so that you can tackle with, with the tools that you have but also recognize that maybe there are gaps in your knowledge and you will have to reach out probably to your colleagues if you're in the industry. Um, it, will, uh, uh, it will be a better move than going back to the books. But I think that's maybe what we are not uh, always offering. Maybe we offer that only in the context of some projects, uh, but it could be done even the, in the context of the more traditional classes, I think. But uh, we also need to recognize that here uh, on campus, uh, we have a limited time, right, to offer a, a, a good experience, but also a lot of information. So how to balance those two things is, is challenging. But I, I would say that that was uh, something, that is something that we could do better. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus, for connecting. Perfect. Thank you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Martial? Interesting discussion. I li really like the, where, they, where they're taking you with yeah. these comments. Uh, anybody else? Okay, uh, if not, then uh, Marcel, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I really you appreciate much. your presentation, uh, your, your comments uh, uh, to answer all the, the various questions and certainly enjoy uh, working with you and ME. It has been a great pass and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, what comes next for you. So Same here. Thank you, Eckhart. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks.